Awesome. Um, well, thanks for coming to hear about Rugged. Um, I'm actually sort of doing this talk for Josh Corman. I don't know if you, everybody's familiar with Josh. Um, he's done talks about Rugged frequently. Um, but he couldn't make it because he's testifying to Congress about cybersecurity today. So um, I hope I can fill his shoes in a reasonable way. Um, I hope that as he's testifying, he'll do more than just take the fifth. Um, I'm sure he'll be quite outspoken. Um, for those of you who don't know Josh, he's kind of a um, thought-leading soldier on the front line of how we handle cybersecurity at a policy level. Um, he recently joined a think tank, so that's kind of his angle. Um, he's very involved with the movement called I Am the Cavalry, which is based on the principle of there's no cavalry coming to help us do security. We have to do it ourselves. So it's basically around figuring out how we can make security part of the software we deliver. Um, and he's working with auto manufacturers and medical device manufacturers to do that. And so I would encourage you to check that out. Um, he deserves that. I'm going to spend just a minute covering what I think he would want you to hear, and then I'll kind of spin off into my take on these topics. So he would use a slide that had, you know, Andreessen's famous comment, software is eating the world, right? It's everywhere. So if you have insecure software, it's everywhere. Um, he would want you to think about DevOps and security as an opportunity, as a place to think about security culture. Um, he would want me to show you the Rugged Manifesto, which I will. He would show a bunch of slides of Honey Badgers um, and talk about how security plus DevOps is like Honey Badgers. And he would talk a lot about empathy, um, because empathy in DevOps is kind of the foundation of, of bridging security and, and DevOps. He would want me to talk about instrumenting your code, so thinking about um, what measurables you have and how you can use them to detect security issues. So um, he always uses an example of using um, higher CPU load, 5% increase in CPU load as an indication that a box got hacked. Um, so all kinds of different creative ways of measuring things. He would tell me to, be mean to, to tell you to be mean to your code using Gauntlet or unit tests or um, Chaos Monkey. He would talk about complexity being the enemy, um, a lack of change man management as being a problem, and he would probably talk about empathy some more. He would also talk about your dependencies. So if you're building a software product, you probably have N dependencies. Um, those may have security issues. Um, he would want you to be active about updating those. Um, and in a lot of ways, DevOps is inherently good at many of those things. And he would say empathy again. So I'm, I, you'll notice I said empathy a lot of times. Josh and I kind of approached this topic from a different place. So um, in this picture, you know, one person's on an island looking out, and it looks like they're going to be saved by a boat. The other person's on the boat, and it looks like they're going to save, be saved because they can get to land. So we, we have kind of very different perspectives. So Josh comes at this from a policy, how to be the most effective, how to design your SDLC in a way that's awesome. I come at it from sort of a more technical level. Um, I hope to convey some of those more concrete ideas as well. Um, I think we sort of, I don't want to say we're yin and yang, but we come from different perspectives. So I'm going to spin into mine in a minute now. How many people have heard of OWASP? Most. That's awesome. That's not always true. Um, in fact, that's rarely true. Um, I stand before you today. I'm the chairman of the OWASP board right now. Um, and I got there by being a developer who did security and trying to bridge that community. And so that's something that OWASP is really trying to figure out. We'd love your help. Um, we want to see, um, we want to see developers engage with OWASP. And we want, as OWASP, we want to engage with developers more. Um, I put this slide up really just to show that my background has really been technical for most of my career. Um, read the bio blog back in the day, worked with Spring, for many years, um, worked at a security company, and then sort of started seeing my applications broken and got a sensitivity toward security in development and realized that I didn't really know what I was doing um, from a security perspective. 
And about four and a half years ago, I founded a company to work with developers just to do that. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And I kind of want to say this feels a little bit like a setup um, because if you were to go to ruggedsoftware.org right now, it's down <laughs> and we're in the always on track. So I'm kind of mad at Josh right now. <laughs> um, but it's actually kind of an interesting little irony, which is the reason the site is down is because it automatically applied a security patch that broke something. So I can stand here before you and say, security, 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 you should do it all the time. But the reality is sometimes it breaks things, right? Um, another, this is kind of funny, I did a podcast for rugged software developers, and we did a bunch of sessions where we talked to developers, we talked to, um, we talked to security people, we talked to Josh, we talked to uh, Wolfgang Gorlick, we talked to a b whole bunch of interesting people. Um, James Wickett, who wrote Gauntlet, was on the podcast. He was really the primary host. And we did a lot of really fun podcasting, but now that domain's expired too. So I, I guess I kind of want to be upfront with you and say I'm here talking about Rugged, but I think maybe what we're going to do is take the best that we can from Rugged and talk about it sort of independently. Um, when I moved to Chicago, which was about 15 years ago, I would get in the elevator in the building I was in and kind of complain when it got cold. I would talk to people and say, I kind of can't believe it's like zero degrees and 20 mile an hour winds or 50 mile an hour winds. And almost always people would kind of say, we don't really complain here. <laughs> like that's not part of our ethos. We don't complain about the weather. So we'll do the same. We're not going to complain about Rugged. We'll just make the best of it and talk about why we're here talking about Rugged. So this is a, I'm sure some of you have used this if you work in Ruby at all. Um, Rubelar is a regular expression like testing site. Um, and the reason I put this up here is along the left you see DevSecOps, DevOpsSec, SecDevOps, OpsDevSec, et cetera, Rugged DevOps, Positive Security, DevOps. And I wrote a regular expression to match those because basically from a security community perspective, we see DevOps happening and we want in. But we really don't know how. And the names are very confusing and sometimes degenerate. And so one of the nice things about Rugged is it gives us a positive way to frame DevOps, Rugged DevOps, right? Um, so you could change the whole title of the talk to sort of positive software security. So let's learn what we can from Rugged, okay? So basically the premise of Rugged, it was a little bit like Agile in the sense that there was a manifesto. And this is the manifesto, right? I recognize that software has become the foundation of the modern, modern world, right? I recognize the awesome responsibility that comes with this foundational role, right? If we're building software and it's everywhere, then we have some responsibility for what happens. I recognize that my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed for, and for longer than it was ever intended. Does anybody have that experience? I certainly do, right? So, if you stop and think about that while you're writing software, you might do it differently, knowing that you have that long tail of maintenance. Perhaps more particular, I recognize that my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security, right? So this is sort of saying embrace the mindset that your software is going to be targeted. Embrace that and make your software rugged in a positive way so that it can withstand those attacks. And basically, I recognize these things, and I'm choosing consciously to, to take a path of building high-quality, resilient, secure software. Um, in many ways, it's re reminiscent of Agile. And when Rugged came out, it was some people criticized it because, I mean, Agile really did change the way I did everything every day. And Rugged has not, right? It's, it was aspirational, maybe the parallel with, with Agile. Um, but it is interesting, it's trying to change the way we think about building things. So one of those statements mentioned, I recognize that my software will be attacked by skilled and persistent adversaries, right? So one of the things I'd like to spend a minute, minute talking about is who are your adversaries? Because you may or may not be thinking about this, right? And many times we make the, the misunderstanding that our adversary is, you know, someone like us, 
by themselves, sitting in the basement, drinking Mountain Dew, maybe younger, something like that, right? That's a common preconception about what your adversary is. And it's shown in the media. Every time you see a hacker, they're wearing a hoodie, right? I almost brought a hoodie just for that visual display. But that's not really who your adversary is, right? Um, so if you look at, at forensics reports about how breaches actually happen, your adversary is actually organized crime, right? And the people who are attacking you are probably working in teams. They probably have stand-ups. <laughs> they probably get benefits, right? Do you think of your attackers as getting benefits? Pair programming? Like, do you think of your attackers that way? I generally didn't. Um, but when you do, it sort of changes your mindset. You realize that you have to make this sort of front and center to how you approach security, how you approach your, your development process. And of course, when you do that, it's going to be contextual. So not everybody has a team of 10 people attacking them all the time. But a good number of the companies represented here do. I certainly see that every day at my clients, right? It's, it's a real thing. So one of the things we can do to help ourselves respond to that is to think about a threat model. A threat model is a term from security, but it's something that's easy to explain, and I'm going to use a little case study to try to explain it to you. It's basically a way for us to understand risk. So this is my car. This is my car in my backyard. It's behind a fence in my driveway. Um, and we're going to sort of think through a threat model about the car, right? It seems sort of obvious that when my car is parked on the street, somebody's going to grab the handle, maybe. Right? It's very possible that somebody's going to grab the handle and open the door or try. I think I have to assume that. So I'll try to lock the door. Somebody else, somebody might break a window to get at something valuable they can see in the car. So I would generally not leave like a laptop exposed in the back seat where somebody might just break the window and open the car. So I have sort of in my head, I have a threat model, even though I'm not really thinking of it as a threat model. So when I park the car on the street, I try to lock it. Try not to leave valuables. Interesting thing is, um, <laughs> I park my car in the driveway back here because I think it deters people from attacking me or from trying to break into the car. But the fact of the matter is, I've had the car broken into here and on the street. So I thought my threat model was pretty good. If I park it behind the gate, it's going to make noise if somebody comes behind the gate into my yard, right? So this day, I actually came out. I sat down in the car with my kids. I have two kids, 10 and 8, right? We get in. We're getting ready to go to school. And I look over at the side door, and, like, you know, the glove compartments are all open, and everything's been shuffled through, right? How did that feel for me, do you think? It felt, like, violated, right? It felt bad. Do you ever feel that in the software you're building? Not yet, but you should, OK? That's part of your threat model. And I want to take this one step further, right? So I also have a garage. You might think if I park the car in the garage, it's going to be safer, right? I would think so. But sort of keeping the analogy to applications, if I park the car in the garage, I need to keep the door open so that I can get it in and out. I need port 80 and 443 to be open so that I can access the application. I don't know if that analogy makes sense to people. If I close the door, it's safer, but nobody can use the car, <laughs> right? So my threat model has to do with what's in the car, what's valuable, how people would get in, how I would prevent them from getting in, et cetera. And you could do the same thing for an application, for a page in an application, for a, an API, et cetera. I figured people would want a few technical security examples, so I'm going to give you some here. Um, and then we'll talk process sort of toward the tail end. So here's a query. I, I don't know how well you can see it. But it should be fairly obvious that the intended query is just the first three lines, ended with an apostrophe and a parenthesis, where we're querying from orders where our reward code is something, right? What you can see is that if I can inject into that variable that's getting plugged in for the rewards code, I can make a much different query. Okay? And what I'm intending to illustrate here is just how nefarious I can be, right? Because 
not only am I changing the query that's running, but I'm running something that's actually querying out of the users table, right? If you look closely, you'll see the union to the users table and the aliasing of the columns from um, password and email to first name and last name. So when this runs, and this is from like a real example, it will drop usernames and passwords in a table of orders, which is obviously bad. I hope it's obvious that that's bad, right? This is an example of SQL injection. I should never let an attacker control what the structure of the query is going to be. Um, so if we want to get rugged about how we handle SQL injection, how do we do that? One thing we do is we train. So you learn about how SQL injection happens. You learn about whether it's possible in the frameworks you're using. I like to use grep. I'm a big fan of grep. Search for things that are sh good signs of problems. So when you see strings being appended together as you build queries, that's a good indication that you might have something to look at. Use parameterized queries. So if you don't know what a parameterized query is, I'm not going to tell you right now. I don't have time, but go find out. It's basically where you see a um, question mark and you're replacing the value in. You can do code review. So if you're doing, if you're doing, if I have a pull request with SQL, with with a new query, and I do, and I'm already doing code review of that pull request, I should be able to look and check whether SQL injection is there almost instantaneously. It's a very small unit of work. So I wouldn't recommend building it into your code review. And use static analysis and web app scanning. So static ana analysis is basically something that rips through your code and gives you feedback about, it parses it and will tell you that you've done this, OK? Anybody tell me what kind of vulnerability this is going to be about? Cross-site scripting? OK, so the greater than and less than signs, this is really exciting. I know you're excited. The, 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 the greater than and less than signs have meaning to the browser, right? They change what it does. The browser evaluates that. It runs code based on interpreting that as a greater than or a less than sign. If I use the, the escaped version with the ampersand LT semicolon, it just renders that less than, right? It's going to show it, but it's never going to try to do anything with it. So I would strongly recommend, and this is a huge problem. I find this in almost every app that I test. I would strongly recommend that you use a framework that encourages you to do output encoding. So for example, if you're using Timeleaf, which is a, a tag library that people often use with Spring, generally, everything is output encoded. You'll always get the ampersand LT semicolon unless you use uText. If you're using mustache, you got to look for the triple brace. If you're using jQuery, look for the inner HTML, right? So there are certain smells, for lack of a better word, like code smells kind of thing, where they can introduce cross-site scripting. And you can, once you know that, you can find those easily in the same code review steps that I just described. You're doing a pull request, you look for whether there's a triple, triple brace. <laughs> Takes a second, right? Static analysis can find cross-site scripting in some contexts. It's not. 100%. Another class of vulnerability that we see a lot is the OWASP term for it is insecure direct object reference, but it's really about authorization. So let's say that Hani is looking at his salary record and Joanne's looking at hers, but Hani can change his, his view or the request that gets sent to see his salary record such that it shows Joanne's. Right? I'm requesting salary record three or salary record five, and if I just ask for it, you give it to me. Right? That's a failure to, to implement authorization. Right? It's very common. There are, I think I have a slide with a case that, that this happened publicly. This is something where, in addition to doing code review for it, you can find it with code review, you can write unit tests for this. Right? So if you want to get rugged, I would write security unit tests. And your security unit tests can say, Register a user, create a project, log out. Register a new user, visit the project. If you can see it, you didn't implement authorization properly if those users are not supposed to see each other's projects. Does that make sense? So it sounds like something that's very accessible in a unit test. Um, this kind of vulnerability is not something that we can find with static analysis or tools very easily. So it, we need people who are in the IDE or in the code looking, thinking about it as we go. 
this was just, I, I always like to include a couple of recent examples. This was just a recent example of that authorization issue where people started seeing other people's orders. This has happened to me in real life applications. If it hasn't happened to you, it's maybe because you don't know it. <laughs> if you're like me, I used to always write my search methods or my list methods such that they would restrict what output came back, right? So I'd say, show me a list of projects, and I'd be very clear that I only wanted to show the user their own projects. But then if you take an action based on that, like a delete or an update, I would not necessarily check again that you were accessing your own project, because how would you have ever seen it? In my mind, as a very naive developer, how would you ever even find the request to update someone else's project? Right. As a villain, it's very easy. Those are just a couple of technical forays. So Rugged is really about how do, we, how do we make the code that we produce withstand these kinds of things, right? And, you know, I don't know that I think Rugged is all that different from security in the SDLC. Um, there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, Ultimately, if you don't have a process to support your security efforts or your availability efforts, um, you're not going to be able to be successful securing or making your system available. So I still have clients that use Waterfall. Many, many of you may still use Waterfall. I know that's, that's not uncommon. Um, the thing that security folks tend to like about Waterfall is that there's a very clear point in time to test. I, if I'm spending three weeks doing QA, I can also do my security testing then, right? I can do a pen test. I can run static analysis that takes five days. I can do whatever I want and fit it in that test window, right? How many people are actually still using Waterfall? Hardly anybody. That's, that's cool. Um, so what's actually the case is that, that the way we write software has changed, right? We're actually doing units of work that are smaller and smaller. Um, we're, we're working in stories, and we're either doing batches of them or we're doing them all implement a story, ship it, implement a story, ship it, right? And what we do from a security perspective changes in that context because the unit of work is so much smaller. So in the requirements phase, we need to think about requirements at a story level or else it's going to be too late. We need to think about our threat model, like the car, what's in the car, what's in the app, what data is there before we build something or while we're building it. But we can make ourselves do that in the context of a story. When we commit code, I like to see static analysis or code review, that kind of thing. I'm a big fan of checklists, just because very short, clear test checklists can be very effective. And then I mentioned unit testing. I'm a big fan of security unit testing, right? So in the context of a story, you can do all these things. And what you get out at the other end is going to be better more secure software, more rugged software. To borrow from Jez Humble, if we look at like continuous delivery, we're taking that story approach and we're basically pushing code all the time, right? And when we see this as a security team, we want to just control it. Like we, that scares the, it scares us. <laughs> because we feel like we're out of control. We don't know when that point in time is that we're supposed to do our testing. And we don't know. Um, what tools to use, because the tools we have take days to run, so they don't work against in an environment or a context where you're constantly shipping code. However, if we're creative and look at this picture, we can do a lot of incremental things to make our process rugged. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I always like to define security requirements up front, if you can. So you may have performance requirements that are implicit to a system you're building. You know you're going to have 1,000 users or 100,000 concurrent users or tens of millions of concurrent users. You sort of set out with that in mind. If you don't, your architecture is going to change, and maybe you accept that. But from a security perspective, we want to start thinking about that as early as we can and setting very clear guidelines. Because developers, without an idea of what we're supposed to do, are not going to do the most. We're going to do, I don't want to say the least, <laughs> but we're going to do what's natural, which is not the most. right? And rarely is the most the right answer either. So how do you choose, right? And the best thing is to, to have a conversation and explore that and communicate about that. So how many people have stakeholders that are asking for security features all the time? 
a few, not many. Um, that's my experience also, is that stakeholders are generally thinking you did security, but they don't really know what that means. Um, so one good way to help them is to introduce a villain persona. So you're doing personas, your story has some persona, some use case you're trying to describe for a person who's achieving something. If you introduce a villain, right, and you make that part of your story review, now you're going to think about, well, how would somebody misuse this page that has a checkout or something like that? Do people, I'm actually curious, I don't know the answer to this. Do people use story points, I guess, generally? Yes. Do you use that in what you would think of as like continuous delivery? Yes. I'd love to talk more about how that works, because I'm, I'm just a little confused. In the context of a sprint, I totally get it. In the context of a story by story, I'm not sure I get it. But what I'm about to tell you is your story point estimates have to include security. This may seem obvious. I'm not sure if it seems obvious. But if it doesn't include security, then none of this works. None of your burn down charts, none of your velocity, nothing that you're using to plan and understand what's happening at a project level are going to work if your security requirements aren't baked into your stories and your story points. Does that make sense? So something I'll do with some clients is help them look at stories. They'll be grooming. Do you go through grooming phases where before you start a sprint, you're going to groom the stories that are about to go in and make sure they're basically ready and well thought through? Well, you can make security part of that, right? You can also do, we talked about this incremental code review at a, at a pull request level. I'm guessing most of you are using continuous integration in this day and age, right? There are lots of opportunities with continuous integration, right? If I'm using Jenkins, just for example, I can very easily plug security tools into Jenkins to get feedback automatically every time I build. Does that sound like a good thing? I mean, kind of the whole basis for writing unit tests and running unit tests every commit is that you want to know as soon, as close to the point where you wrote the code as possible what the issues might be with it so that you can fix them very close to when you first wrote it. And the same thing is true for security issues. This is just a couple of examples of running a tool. Actually, this is a, sort of a good point to segue and say, you know, one way that we could help bridge security and software communities would be for all of you to help OWASP with open source security projects. Because unfortunately, a lot of security people are not great developers. <laughs> so we write tools that are not very polished or very clean or very well architected. They sort of work. I don't want to knock security people, but we tend to think like, hey, we can write a Python script to chain a bunch of things together. That's pretty awesome. But we're not like building something for general use that needs to kind of withstand the architectural rigor that, that most of the systems you're building require. So to the extent that you could help us, that would be awesome. I, would, I have several projects I commit to right now that I'd love to have people help with that would probably help you as well if you plug them into your continuous integration process. So one of the things that ran in that background in Jenkins was static analysis. So static analysis is essentially parsing code, turning it into something we can understand, and looking for problems. Um, and there are limits to what it can find, but it's useful if, it if you have tools available, we should use them. So an example with checklists, maybe we have a, a story, right? As a regular user, I need to be able to verify, view my profile data, ensure that it contains correct information, Blah, 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 right? So we may normally have acceptance criteria we're going to add to a story that help QA or us. Maybe it's helping us write unit tests. Maybe it's helping testers know what they should be looking for. Maybe it's just defining where the bar is. Well, we could add security items to that very easily, right? And now we've articulated to the developer that's going to end up estimating and then implementing this, this feature exactly what the bar is and where they need to go. And some of the acceptance criteria that are security related can be tested by regular people who aren't security specialists. So that's one of the things I'd like to break down is the idea that there's this concept of a security specialist. There are some. There are certain things that are very, very esoteric. John Downey is going to talk about cryptography later. That is very esoteric. Don't write your own crypto. I'm not saying everybody should do security. But in the context of your application, 
oh, we should make sure the user should only be able to see their own profile. That sort of seems obvious to me and is something that I think either a developer or a tester could find or verify, right? I think testers could identify PII pretty easily as well. Like, what data is sensitive? You train people once, and then they can help you. Right? So I like the idea of blurring and breaking down those barriers between who's thinking about security and who's not. And I think that's kind of the essence of Rugged. We talked about some of these, sorry. This is kind of an interesting example. Um, so a lot of times people say, well, we're using SSL, so we're secure. Right? And in this case, we have a form to buy a book that's using SSL, so it's secure, right? Except that I can potentially debit my own account by putting negative quantities in the amount. So that's what that's trying to illustrate, right? That's a business logic type of security flaw that can't be found by static analysis or lots of other tools. So you can do things like write unit tests for it or manually test for it, or, right? Lots of times, making a system secure or rugged is about getting into the story and the workflow and figuring out how that feature could be abused. So how many people have bought something on Amazon? <laughs> Most people, right? How many people have bought something and shipped it to a new address? A lot, right? What did Amazon do when you did that? So, so it's not the password, it's the payment, right? So you have to re-enter your credit card number if you're shipping to a new address, OK? This is because there was a lot of fraud where people were taking stolen accounts, like, I don't know if anybody heard about the LinkedIn dump of 117 million people, right? Guess what? 20% of those accounts are reused on other sites at least, right? So I see this with clients. I think pretty much any big company is going to see this, where any large password dump is going to get tried against your users to see if that account exists. So if mattconda at gmail.com is a user in your system, and I use the same password between LinkedIn and Capital One or whoever, right? Now somebody can log in as me, and they can do whatever I can do, probably, right? So that's dangerous, right? That's not really a secure, in a way, it doesn't feel like a security problem because it's not like I have a buffer overflow or a SQL injection or something, right? I'm just abusing something about your system that's not watching out for that. But what Amazon realized was that by looking at their, their flow through checkout, they could add a step that would dramatically reduce fraud. I would argue they made their app and their business more rugged by doing that. Does that make sense? And so I can stand here and tell you about the OWASP top 10, which I would love to do. Believe me, I could talk for hours about it. But ultimately, a lot of the things that you need to think about aren't these canned, pre-known things. They're things that you only know while you're in there writing the code. And that's why I want to break down the barriers. And that's, again, what I think Rugged is all about. So you want to think about how your feature could be misused. Given that hardly anybody at the table with me yesterday knew the bio blog, does anybody know this? The spy versus spy? OK, good. At least a few people. I... Another thing we can do is operationalize data about our system, right? So I just mentioned Amazon having an extra step in checkout. Something that you can do is see if a given user has had a lot of failed logins or is doing something very outside their normal purchase flow. Right? Your credit card companies are already doing that. They're detecting fraud by doing that. That may not be something you need to implement yourself, but there's data that's there for you to use for security. And depending on your threat model, which we talked about, right? if, if I have you know, my family in the car and lots of money, <laughs> I'm going to do more to protect it. I might do something like that. So when we talk about trying to do security in a, in a DevOps environment, we want to get down to the smaller increments of work, right? The stories. So if we're doing unit tests, we want to do security unit tests. And security, if we're doing code review, we want to do security code review. We talked about some of this. I'm going to. This is kind of an interesting example. How many people have heard of Zap? 
a few, not many. So Zap is an attack proxy that will simulate an attacker, like a very brute force, not smart attacker. Something that you can do is wire this up to automatically run against your app in Jenkins at night. So, OK, I mean, I know that many of us are 24 by 7 businesses now, so people are working all over the world. But let's just say you have eight hours where people are writing code all day, and then you have a night where people are not using the test system heavily. You can wire it up so that you're scanning at night to get feedback with a tool like Zap. Sorry, I'm going to go, f I'm skipping a couple things to try to get to where we could have questions. So something that's interesting about DevOps, there is a period, and actually I still see it, where, where sort of classic security folks are scared of DevOps because now the line of separation of duties is gone or is, is blurred, right? So if you're, if you're on a team that's doing DevOps, you may be writing provisioning scripts that control how your production system works. You may also be writing business features, right? And generally, security people like to see there's people who deploy and manage production, and there's people who write code. And they're different people, and they shouldn't overlap. And the premise behind that is that the people who are writing code might put something malicious in it and then deploy it, like a backdoor or something like that. Well, First of all, in my experience, <laughs> having the separation doesn't stop the backdoor from getting out anyway, because the people who are deploying don't recognize that there's a backdoor. But further, if you're documenting your provisioning with scripting, like Chef or something like that, you can audit using that. So you don't need to do the same level. I mean, you should still be rigorous, but you don't need to necessarily run deep vulnerability scans against every software library you're using if you can check how you're provisioning each server and you know you're doing the right thing. The other thing is that with, with DevOps, we build and burn, right? So we might, I mean, not everybody does this, but we might reprovision a new server rather than updating one that's already there. And that can have big benefits where you're automatically updating all the dependencies as you go each time you, you image it. So I like to think of sort of these DevOps things as being self-documenting. So it's like if your compliance folks are saying, hey, how are you doing things? What, what, what we want to do is educate them about, about these processes so that they can see, um, see that it's a, it's a controlled process, which is really what they care about. We want to embrace change. I'm going to just go quickly here. Another way to think about this is reactively, right? So we have these sort of events that happen in our, in our development cycle, and we can leverage those as triggers to make ourselves think, right? So we're going to commit. Maybe we should be running unit tests or doing code review. These are things we can do at commit time, making sure we have requirements covered, checking dependencies. When we deploy, one nice thing about the other nice, one other nice thing about provisioning with scripts is you can set up a burn environment very easily. So theoretically, if you want to set up an environment to run security tools against, that should be easy in an environment where, in a, in a environment where you're building those things all the time, if you have a, a classic pipe, sort of pipeline. When you're deploying is another good time to run Gauntlet, which is the tool that James Wickett wrote. And then there are other things that kind of still happen outside of a very specific time frame. So I don't know what the triggers are for these. For many companies, they never do them. <laughs> Other companies do a lot of them. But these are all things that you should do periodically, but they don't really make sense in the context of a commit or a story or a release, necessarily. Lots of people, then, they have a security incident, and that's a trigger. How many people have had security incidents that they're just a few? You know what we say in security about that, right? Right? There's the companies that have been hacked and know it, and the companies who have been hacked and don't know it. I mean, that's, OK. Um, I think to try to reemphasize one of these points, I'm going to do a quick demo here, just to kind of for fun. So what I'm running is an old Struts app. Can you see this? Kind of. You don't really need to see too, too much. But I'm running a, 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 a Tomcat instance that happens to be running some, a Struts app, right? So I can go into, this is Metasploit. 
Metasploit is an exploit framework. I can search for struts. And then, and by the way, I don't know how to, I don't know how to hack at all. I'm just using a console here. So I'm kind of joking, sort of. So then I have tab completion, so I can go, oh, I want to use this one. Let's use, let's use struts dev mode, show our options. I want to set my R host to be localhost. And I'm going to say run just for brevity. So what it's doing, it starts a reverse handler, which is basically like a socket locally that's listening. And then it attacks the struts app, which connects back to the local handler and gives me kind of command and control over that struts app. So in this case, it sort of looks degenerate because struts is running locally and Metasploit is running, remote, running locally. But in a more realistic example, I might be running this in an, in an Amazon instance or somewhere else, right, with a public IP, and I might be attacking a public struts server, right? And the thing that's scary about this is I don't have to have, I don't have to authenticate, I don't have to do anything to be able to do this against struts. And what you're looking at here now is a shell to the remote system. So, oops, I'm just tapping. Uh, oh, awesome. <laughs> Not sure what I did there. The point is that shell is running essentially as Tomcat in the Tom, Tomcat directory and can do whatever Tomcat can do. Okay. I don't actually know. I must be in the wrong RVM session or something. So what I just did, though, just to kind of be clear, is I exploited something that was a known vulnerability in struts, right? It's an old struts. It has a known issue. I can attack it. Everybody in the world knows I can attack it, but it's still in your app. Why, right? So here I'm showing you a tool called dependency check, which will check all of your libraries against known vulnerabilities. So you can run this, and it'll give you XML that's like this that will say, hey, you're running struts, and it's got this OGL, OGNL injection, right? So this is the vulnerability that I used to perform the exploitation that dependency check can tell me about. You can run this in Jenkins as well. You can run it a bunch of different ways. You can put it in Maven. Um, it will give you feedback about libraries you're using that are a problem. So. Another point that Josh would want me to make is what percentage of your software is like what you've written and what percentage of your software is like your stack, right? So I don't know. Like I've built a ton of Spring apps. Usually that's 40 to 60 jars that I'm including, right? That's a big attack surface that's not really my code that I don't even know. So something you want to do is think about your app as having a bigger attack surface than just that one piece you're running and use something like dependency check to get it. So what is Rugged all about? I mean, we spent all this time talking about security in the SDLC and how to make your software more secure. Really, partly, Rugged is about security folks, whether we're white hats, gray hats, or black hats, and that's not your typical black hat. Um, it's about us. We, we, we look like wolves to you often, right? When we come to talk to you, you don't often want to talk to us because we are in the habit of saying no. We look like wolves, right? But we want to be wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> we want to weave security into what you're already doing in a constructive way, and that's really what Rugged is all about. It's about finding those incremental opportunities to do better and trying to do that, do, do better. <laughs> We talked about a bunch of specific examples. It's kind of like a Trojan horse, right? It's like, Rugged is awesome. DevOps is, Rugged DevOps is awesome. Let's adopt it. And while you do it, you're going to get security. But you didn't have to stop and think about it. That's Burning Man, where I think they burned this, which is pretty awesome. I didn't get to go, but. It's my time. I'm very happy to field questions. 
Um, I'm sorry that Josh couldn't be here, but I hope that um, this was fun. It's fun for me. Thanks. <laughs>